All right, so let's take a look at multi-thread programs and what is it that's hard about them and all the different aspects, okay? Okay, so, oops. Okay, so multi-thread program, essentially the hard part about them is that they must work for all interleavings of threads. So when you have paddle programs, each of the threads in the paddle program itself runs asynchronously. That is, they do not coordinate with each other, which means the actions in each of these threads could be happening in any order. They could um, all happen at the same time. They could happen uh, A before B or B before A. And you really, if you don't add any synchronization, have no control over this order. The problem with this is now based on every run of the program, based on the input, based on the toss of a coin, a program could essentially be doing different things. And that's bad because normally when you program uh, in the single threader program, it always does the same thing. You feed it the same inputs, it's going to do the exact same thing again. It's not going to behave any differently uh, across the runs. Whereas now with the multi thread program, it's saying even if I give you the same input, uh, you could be behaving differently uh, based on the toss of a coin or randomly, uh, unpredictably. And so that's bad because then it's hard to reason about bugs are all extremely hard to track down um, and the funny part is that they may not even happen when you test it but then it may happen in your field at the worst possible time and unless the program is carefully coordinated and you follow all the discipline and all the API calls they are, it becomes really hard to debug and this is a primary challenge with multi-threaded programs as opposed to single-threaded programs which are predictable, deterministic and essentially, if you feed the same input, they give you the same answer, which means you can use something like GDB. Um, if you use a debugger like GDB with multi thread programs, it can get, it's quite hard. Just because it works in your debugger doesn't mean it's going to work in the field on you. You can write programs with races, and you can, um, you can experience this for yourself. Um, the next thing you got to understand is, um, to understand a concurrent program or try to, as a program or to try to reason about it, you need to fundamentally understand what atomic or indivisible operations are. That is the sequence of operations in your program um, that have certain properties uh, that make it easy to um, reason about. So if you look at uh, what atomic operations are, um, oops. All right, so if you look at what atomic operations are, an atomic operation is essentially one that always runs to completion or not at all. That is, it is indivisible. It cannot be stopped in the middle and cannot, someone else can't be looking at its state. It does not make its state visible. Either all of it happens or none of it happens. If you don't have atomic blocks in general, um, and if you don't have atomic operations, um, it's very hard to coordinate threads to work together. When I say work together, I mean um, that they modify state together and you could be writing variables that another thread looks at uh, and similarly another thread could be in the same. Uh, you could be creating values and then passing it out to other threads. In general, if you don't have atomic operations, the only um, real operations two threads can do is just operate on independent data. That is, each one grabs a chunk of the total data and then operates on it without the other one really looking at it until the end of the program and then they make everything visible with each, with each other. Uh, that is, they're not really coordinating. Um, on, if you really think about what operations are atomic on, uh, on most machines, uh, reads and writes, also known as loads and stores. So this is a fundamental way in which uh, programs interact with the uh, state. So they read or write variables. When you do that, essentially that read or write is translated into some machine operations, and uh, then these operations happen in an atomic fashion. Um, many instructions are often uh, not atomic. Uh, in the past, they used to be more and more, and this used to be past a part of the software spec. Uh, for example, the x86 string operations. Um, or the VAX and IBM 360 had these operations that copied a whole array, which was similar. Uh, double precision floating point stores are uh, not typically not atomic because they operate on large and wide 
uh, set of bytes and by the time you know the, you write the first and the second and third fourth fifth sixth seventh byte someone could have modified the eighth one right uh, in double position 40 point really writes at 16 bytes which makes it quite hard um, and these are defined as part of the software spec when I say atomic essentially again to reiterate it means the operation either runs to completion or not at all and the operations intermediate states are not visible. So for example, a double precision floating point has to uh, write out, let's say, um, uh, four, by four bytes, right? So let's say that it, writes, it wants to write out four bytes. Uh, byte one, it writes out. Byte two, it writes out. Byte three, it writes out. By the time it gets to byte four, someone else it cor has corrupted it, okay? This cannot, if it's an atomic operation, this cannot happen. If it's an atomic operation, then um, all these bytes would be uh, written together or none at all. All right, a few more definitions uh, before we embark on a specific example and take a look at um, the different ways in which we can solve that problem. Uh, the first definition is synchronization. So synchronization is essentially the process of using atomic op operations to coordinate multiple concurrent threads that operate on data that's shared between the threads. Okay, so very simple. So you take your atomic operations and then the way you coordinate them, the order in which they run um, uh, each other, um, the order in which maybe there's no order amongst them, it doesn't really matter. Um, as long as, for example, you increment a counter, so you all increment a counter, another person increments a counter, it doesn't matter which order you increment them in, as long as both the increments do happen. Okay, so that's all synchronization. Uh, mutual exclusion is essentially ensuring that only one thread does a particular thing at a time. That is, the fact that you're running means that the other person is not running. So not only are you saying that you're running, but you're also controlling the fact that the other person doesn't run. Uh, this is quite useful in, law, in a, many cases where uh, you're, the fact you make assumptions about the shared state based on the fact that no one else could be running. Critical section essentially is a piece of code that only one thread can execute at a time. That is, as part of mutual exclusion, um, essentially, the, the thing that the thread mutually excludes, that is the thing that it's running after it mutually excludes other threads, is known as the critical section. That is only one thread gets into it at any given time. Uh, in Java, if you, people are familiar with Java, then this term synchronize essentially makes the function on which synchronized is specified uh, a critical section. And critical section is the result of mutual exclusion. And Critical section and mutual exclusion are essentially two ways of describing the 